as you can see, the talk tonight is, is about the anxious teenager, understanding and managing anxiety in teens. And I'm Mark Grant, I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been working um, in the field for about 30 years. Um, so just a quick overview of what, what I'm going to be covering tonight. Um, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit just a little bit about what is adolescence because um, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique stage of life and um, having anxiety in that age of your life uh, has certain implications that are different to if you had it at some other stage. So I want to just talk, I'll start by talking a little bit about what adolescence is and why it's important and how anxiety can affect you there. Then we'll, talk, we'll be talking about what causes anxiety, where it comes from, um, take a bit of the mystery out of um, what, why you might have anxiety. And then I'll be um, covering some tips for what parents can do to help their anxious teenager, if you're a parent, and if you're a teenager, what you can do to not only manage your anxiety, but also actually how to turn your anxiety into a kind of superpower. And um, this, I think, is um, perhaps one of the most interesting and exciting aspects of anxiety is the idea that it ne needn't necessarily be a bad thing or a problem. It can actually be something that, if you know how to channel it, can actually make you more effective and more successful in, in all areas of your life, social, vocational, uh, you name it. So just before we start, um, how, big, how big a problem are we looking at here? Well, um, one in four teenagers uh, have some sort of anxiety disorder uh, compared with about one in five adults. So it's a bit more common in teens particularly girls, and that's true throughout the lifespan. Uh, anxiety affects uh, women and girls much more than it does men, uh, for, for to be for hormonal reasons. And a recent report from uh, Murdoch University um, also indicated that reports of anxiety are, are on the upswing, and in the, in the, in the fact that they've doubled in the last five years. So we might look at some of the reasons for that in the talk as we go along. So, as I said, let's just talk a little bit about what is adolescence? What does it mean to be a teenager? So, adolescence is a developmental phase when a person is, is transitioning from a child to an adult, and it's a period of profound physical, mental, and emotional changes. Uh, it's a period where a uh, person undergoes increased social and academic pressures and where they're also experiencing a lot of brain changes. So there's a lot going on in adolescence. In terms of uh, a, 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 de a de developmental phase, um, adolescence obviously comes after infancy and, it's, and what happens to you and how you experience your adolescence is affected by how you went as an infant. So when you're an infant or a, young, a younger child, the key developmental task is to develop a sense of trust in the world and those around us. And if for some reason um, we're unable to do that, then, then the child goes, become, goes into adolescence with a sense that the world is not a safe place for them to, to grow and develop and show who they are. And that child may have um, an, an inhibited sense of who they are. I've got a question. I'm just going to check that before I go on to make sure that there's nothing to do with the performance. Oh, okay. I'll come back to that question uh, at the end. Okay. If that's okay, I'll answer all the questions at the, at the end. Okay, so um, um, infancy uh, uh, very important, and then you've got the the teenage years. Now, um, the there are two KT things that teenagers are trying to achieve, and that is um, 
in the early teenage years, the most important thing for a teenager is to develop a sense of belonging with a peer group. In the later teenage years, um, it's more about individuation. And um, the, that's when teens start to express their opinions more strongly about things. And they're more, they should be, by that age, starting to um, choose groups to belong to that are more aligned with who they really are and their own values and a sense of themselves. So there's a lot going on in, in adolescence. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's also a period of profound physical and mental change. So um, boys and girls are uh, developing sexually and physically. They're putting on, on muscle mass and, and body weight. They're, there's a growth spurt. And um, that's just part of this rapid sort of sense of change that's going on, not only physically, but also mentally. So uh, in the um, uh, social sense, as I said, they're developing uh, a sense of self, which um, these days is mediated a lot by social media. Um, mentally, um, they're learning to, uh, teenagers are learning to think, uh, to develop impulse control. Uh, to develop uh, a more an ability to manage and assess risk. Their language skills imp are improving throughout the course of their adolescence. And teenagers, uh, at a time when they should be starting to learn some emotional self-regulation. Socially, uh, the ta one of the tasks of adolescents is to separate emotionally from one's parents and to develop an increased sense of, of you know, their own personal identity. Um, and of course, exploration of sexuality and relationships is a part of that. Uh, morally, uh, teenagers start you know, to develop an ability to see the perspectives of other people and um, to develop a sense of responsibility um, you know, to do, you know, to wash the dishes out without having to be asked to do it. Um, to see that there, um, that there are uh, things that need to happen without um, having to be told or asked to do it. Um, okay. So that's going on. Okay. Um, uh, academic pressures, of course, um, as as uh, you go through adolescence, uh, the, uh, you know, the academic pressures increase and um, uh, you need to succeed and achieve academically. And you know, it becomes the foundation for your adult development. Uh, different, now, of course, different, different teens will uh, cope with these tasks and demands uh, differently and some better than others. Um, some teens will get to their late teens and still be struggling with emotional self-regulation. Some teens will you know, be able to do that at the age of 13 or 14. Uh, some teens will have a sense of who they are at quite an early age. Some teens are still struggling with that well into their 20s. So these tasks of adolescence um, can, uh, you know, can be achieved at very different ages and stages than every individual. I'm not going to talk in too much detail about the uh, brain changes associated with adolescence, but they involve uh, areas of the brain involved in physical coordination, emotional regulation, motivation and goal setting, and judgment. <laughs> and that particularly uh, the area of judgment involves the development of the event or medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in risk assessment. And a lot of those tragic accidents that you see on the news about teenagers, they're driving at high speeds and, and crashing into power poles. Um, often uh, teenagers in their late teens or even early you know, you know, kids in their early 20s, how they have not uh, successfully uh, developed a, a good sense of risk assessment and judgment. And that, that's tragically the problem. Um, of course, we've talked about uh, uh, physical changes. So 
Uh, these can cause, be a cause of anxiety. Um, recent research found that one in five British teenage girls can bear to look at themselves in the mirror and two thirds are unhappy with their body and want to lose weight. Uh, another um, uh, cause of anxiety can be uh, genetic uh, heritability factors. So researchers estimate that about 30 to 40 percent of the risk of anxiety is genetic. So if you're an anxious teenager, it's quite likely that mum or dad has a bit of an anxious disposition as well. And um, of course, uh, we're all uh, we inherit, you know, certain dispositions, uh, physical qualities, personality characteristics from our family. So it's, it would be impossible for us not to inherit, um, you know, a disposition to anxiety if that's there. Um, I think probably the problem there is that um, most parents who have anxiety um, uh, don't sit their, their children down one day and say, now look, I've got anxiety. So it's, it's something that might come up for you and you know, here's some things I've learned to help you understand and manage it. Um, the point about uh, genetics is that uh, you should never feel ashamed or embarrassed for having anxiety um, because it's not something that you, you know, you're making happen to yourself. It's something uh, you know, to inherit. Um, of course, anxiety is a uh, uh, part of, um, how shall we say, natural human emotional responses. It's necessary for survival uh, to warn us of danger and anxiety um, gives us faster response times, uh, increased energy to avoid danger. You can think of it as being like a, a sixth sense. So anxiety is, is necessary. Uh, we wouldn't have survived as a species without a bit of anxiety. Uh, there's a um, a school of uh, psychology called evolutionary psychology, where you know they, they look at the purpose of emotions such as anxiety and depression, and um, they've actually concluded that uh, if we didn't have anxious people, we wouldn't have survived because we would have all got eaten by saber-toothed tigers. It's the it's the anxious ones that uh, are the better survivors. So if you've got anxiety. You know, you're, we, we need you. You're the reason we're here. Uh, another cause of anxiety <laughs> can, be, um, can come from just the dynamics in the family. If there's too much tension or conflict, that can make uh, children and teens edgy and uneasy. Uh, uh, kids don't like to see mum and dad arguing. Not only, not only fighting, but if the parents are just, just busy with their lives and their careers and perhaps a bit distracted, um, children can grow up feeling uh, mm, unable to get the support they need to deal with their feelings. Um, there's a, a, a famous Australian a feminist who died a few years ago called Mary Owens, who was raised by a very harsh stepmother. And she writes in her biography that um, she never, she realized as, as an older woman that she'd never learned how to love people, that she just all that she learned, how, the only way she knew how to love was to worry. Uh, another cause of anxiety uh, can be lack of sleep. So, um, and there are a lot of uh, things that can keep uh, teenagers awake these days, as you can see from the picture. Um, the good old internet and computer screens, which of course produce uh, the blue light, which is um, the wrong kind of light for that time of day and it's actually causing a chemical reaction in your brain that keeps you awake. So if nothing else, um, you should if you're a teenager or a parent of a teenager, you should know about programs that can 
um, change the, the screen color and I called F Lux. F Lux, F L U X. Um, but of course, the problem with um, lack of sleep is that it causes fatigue and that increases an individual's propensity to anxiety. Uh, another uh, thing that can cause anxiety is if um, you have an illness or an injury or disability. Um, because as we mentioned earlier, um, adolescence is a time of, of physical development and change. And anything that inhibits your ability to function physically and participate in social and sporting and recreational activities uh, and um, can undermine the teenager's ability to bond socially and you know, develop self-esteem and confidence. Um, of course, if you have an, if you're a teenager with an anxious disposition, that will that will affect your self-confidence and your ability to um, interact socially. So, just having anxiety as a teenager just makes everything about being a teenager and all the things that you have to cope with and achieve that much harder. But particularly socially, and unfortunately, teenagers are always the most compassionate and accepting. So we've talked a bit about how, how big a problem anxiety is and some of the causes of anxiety in teens. And now we're going to talk about um, what, how, how teenagers can cope with anxiety, beginning with parents. Um, just this last slide, um, perhaps summing up what I've been talking about, the causes of anxiety how being how teenagers are you know the most misunderstood people on the planet they're treated like children and expected to act like adults and i'm sure uh, any of your teenagers out here listening can relate to that one so uh, i'm going to talk very briefly about how parents can what parents can do to help their anxious teens and then i'm going to talk to um directly to the teenagers that are viewing um take you through some tips to help you cope with anxiety so these are my six top tips for helping parents uh, help their anxious team. Um, so provide understanding, love, empathy and support. Encourage acceptance. Help develop confidence and skills. Make sure they get enough sleep. Provide consistency. And if all else fails, get professional help. So, love and support. Well, obviously, I'm sure all the parents who are listening to this or who, who have anxious teens are already doing that. Um, one of the, uh, a couple of tips, I suppose, specific tips about how to do that if you have an anxious teen is um, to pay close attention to what's going on with your teenager's emotions. Um, teenagers aren't always comfortable talking about how they're feeling and they may need a bit of coaxing and encouragement but not too much pressure at the same time. So um, for example if you ask um, many teenagers you know how you're feeling you know you won't get much of a response but if you offer what we in psychology call a probe statement that give, makes it easier for the person who perhaps is feeling anxious to acknowledge how they're feeling by indicating that you, um, you know, you have an idea that they are feeling anxious or worried. So, for example, if you notice, if you're paying attention and you notice your teenage son or daughter, you know, is looking a bit anxious or preoccupied, you might just say something to like to them, like, you know, you look worried or that that must be hard. And and by making that statement, you're um, showing the, the t your teenager that you're in, you're in tune, you're aware that something's going on for them emotionally. You're not forcing them to talk about it, but you're letting them know that you're you're on the same page. You're you're tuned in, and you're there if they want to talk about it. And if you so if you pay attention and make statements that show that you're observing and thinking about your teenager's feelings, that will make it easier for them to open up and to talk without feeling pressure. Okay, the second thing is to encourage acceptance 
because a lot of any teenager and many adults who feel who have anxiety feel like they have, have some problem that they're abnormal, um, that it's a shameful emotion that it should be banned and uh, gotten rid of. Um, but no, anxiety is necessary and normal, and um, it's part of life. Uh, some people have more of an anxious disposition than others. Some people are better sports people. Some people are better academics. Uh, everyone's different. So um, remember we talked earlier about how, particularly in the early teens, uh, the sense of belonging uh, is important. And um, having anxiety can make a teen uh, feel um, you know, different and that that's not okay because it sort of makes them stand out. But um, we're, not, we're not all clones of each other. We are different. So, so it's important to you know, give your team that message. Uh, that there are, and also to uh, anxious teens and adults, anyone and anyone with anxiety in general, has a high, they have a high need for control because the more in control you are, the less anxious you're going to feel. But the reality is there are many things in life that you can't control. So um, this is a hard reality that you, you know you have to let your team uh, be reminded of and to know. Life's going to involve change. We all know that. One of the, in addition to death and taxes, one of the few certainties of life. So, uh, and especially as we've been talking about the task of and the changes that teenage years involve. Um, there's, there's a lot of social, academic, physical changes going on, and um, they can be quite challenging at times, but, but um, uh, they're not to be feared or uh, avoided. Uh, they can, you know, um, they are hard, and um, with support and love and understanding, they can be dealt with. Another very important uh, point is, is is that it's, it's to know that it's okay to make mistakes. Anxious people, teenagers, all ages, are often uh, terrified of making mistakes because they already have a sense of inferiority or that there's something wrong with them and they want to get it right in order to feel good about themselves. But it's impossible um, to be perfect or to get things right all the time. It's, it's okay to make mistakes. It's how we learn. Um, making mistakes is an, a necessary part of life. This is an important message that every parent should give to their teenager, whether they have anxiety or not. And, that, and um, lastly, but not least, that anxiety can be an advantage. So we'll be talking a bit, a bit later about that, but that um, anxious teens and anxious people in general are uh, trying harder, they're paying more attention to detail, they don't quit, um, they uh, tend to have a sort of uh, determined, 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 they're more determined to stick things through until the end and, and do a really good job. They can, they can be perfectionistic. And if those qualities are channeled in the right way, uh, they are an advantage. You know, the anxious teenagers' assignments um, which maybe they sweat it out until midnight, are often, you know, of very high quality. And um, the trick is to balance out how much effort the team is putting in with, um, you know, the actual output so that they're not stressing unduly. So here's a great quote I like about acceptance. It's okay to be scared. Being scared means you're about to do something really, really great. And that's the thing about anxiety. Um, although sometimes there can be a tendency to want to avoid situations, most anxious teens are actually doing the best that they can. And, and um, that quotes about not being scared of those feelings and not judging them and having confidence in um, their own courage to, to, to quote another saying, um, you know, feeling fearful does not mean the absence of courage. And another, another quote about acceptance, which goes to that point about being different, it's okay to be different. 
don't worry if people think you're crazy. You are crazy. You have that kind of intoxicating insanity that lets other people dream outside of the lines and become who they're destined to be. So a lot of uh, anxious teens, uh, they've got a slightly different way of looking at the world and of doing things, um, which is um, can be quite creative and quite unique. And really, um, as, you'll, as you'll see at the end of the talk, um, if it's channeled correctly, it can end up actually being uh, the secret of uh, that person becoming a great success. Okay, another thing that parents can help their anxious teens with is in, in building confidence. So how do you do that? Um, well, challenge negative patterns of thinking. So if your uh, daughter, son or, or anxious son or daughter has a bit of a habit of uh, being self-critical or uh, negative with themselves, <coughs> Um, pull them up on that and um, uh, remind them you know, of that they're doing their best and that uh, of, of their successes and their skills and the, and the things that they can do. Um, it's too easy to focus on what we can't do or what we're failing at and forget that uh, you know we have uh, successful capabilities as well and teenagers, need to be reminded of that rather than to go into that sort of critical either or thinking. It's also really important to support them in doing activities that they feel attracted to or are naturally good at because um, those are the areas where most of us will naturally develop a sense of competence um, rather than perhaps trying to do things that we think uh, mum and dad want us to do or our peers want us to do or uh, it's socially uh, expected to do um, it's it, it's about finding out what you want to do or what your what your teenage son or daughter wants to do and um, helping them um, and supporting them to do that um, so I've heard, I've heard stories of parents who um, got their children to, you know, learn musical instruments and things um, with the idea that it would, it would help them, but it wasn't really what that child wanted to do. And um, and, the, and um, actually ended up creating more anxiety for them helping. Uh, encouraging your teenage son or daughter to make choices based on their own preferences of others. Um, and also, um, uh, remind your teenage son and daughter that achieving things takes time and many steps. Um, not to give up when things aren't going right or they feel like they're failing. Um, learning a new skill, like riding a bike, uh, you know, often involves a lot of failure before you get it right. That's normal. That's part of life. Okay. Make sure they get enough sleep. So um, adolescents require nine to nine and a half hours of sleep a night. They have a delayed sleep phase, which means that um, they often um, feel like going to sleep later and waking up later. That's, uh, that's been scientifically proven now. It's not that they're lazy. Um, it's that their sleep clock is is uh, different to that of adults, and it's really strange to me that, um, if you like, society and the education system you know, hasn't really caught on to this yet and started making allowances for it. Um, most teens just aren't morning people. Um, so um, practically, um, you, you need to limit that screen time late at night. And um, perhaps uh, allow them a little bit of a lie in when that's possible. And understand if they're a bit grumpy in the morning. Um, okay, that's what I need to really say about sleep. Okay, uh, find sources of consistency or, or encourage your team 
to find sources of consistency. So why have I got a picture of the Avengers there? Well, many teens who, uh, uh, who perhaps enjoyed the uh, Marvel superhero movies um, would have, many teen people in the late teens now would have uh, come into early, early adolescence around the time the first superhero movies were released. And um, just this month, we had the final installment of the Avengers. And it was kind of an ending for people who had been following um, that, that uh, you know, storyline, if you like. And the Guardian newspaper um, got uh, teenagers to write in about their experience of that movie and that whole genre of movies. And um, this is a, a, a quote from uh, one of the people we wrote in, and I'll read it. She said, the initial teenage years are some of the weirdest, most confusing years of your life. And I formed an attachment to this family. She's talking about the Avengers. These movies were a source of consistency. Growing up with these movies has meant that most of my life has included this universe. It's how I formed friendships and bonded with my dad. I'm going to university soon. It's sad to see that I also have to leave that part of my life. So whether they get it through uh, going to a movie with, with you or um, uh, reading Harry Potter books or following um, Marvel movies, uh, any, sort, any sort of situation that gives your teenager a sense of uh, consistency helps them, you know, to, to helps to anchor them and maintain their sense of identity through that time of upheaval and change. And um, you know, now they can find, you know, you never know where they're going to find it. All right. So now, oh, so and by the way, all those all those tips for parents are available um, as downloads as tip sheets from my website, which I'll um, give you at the end of the talk. But if you have to leave early, it's the anxietyreleaseapp.com website. That's anxietyreleaseapp.com. And they're under the blog section. All right, so teenagers, how to manage anxiety. Uh, we're, we're gonna talk about how to regulate your breathing how to practice mindfulness, how to learn to tolerate uncertainty, uh, something called bilateral stimulation, and last but not least, how to turn anxiety into a superpower. Right, so breathing. Your, the normal respiration rate is 12 to 20 a minute, um, but um, most uh, a lot of uh, teens and adults with anxiety are hyperventilating. So if you check your respiration rate, just, just by counting your out breaths for 60 seconds, if it's above 20, you're hyperventilating. And um, you can, um, there are actually so many apps for, for helping with hyperventilating. I'm just going to look up one of them that I've got on my phone. It's called um, Breathing Zone. Now, that's a paid app. It's about $4 or something. But there are many, many apps that have that, that teach you how to slow your breathing down, to breathe diaphragmatically, and to um, help restore your breathing rate to a more normal level. And basically the problem with hyperventilation is that if you're, it won't kill you, but if you're hyperventilating, um, you're not replacing the carbon dioxide in your lungs and it'll make you feel yawny, foggy, uh, sort of tired, and, and sometimes a bit spacey. So just, just changing your breathing is a really good, uh, easy thing to do that will make you feel better pretty, pretty quick. All right, another strategy is to practice mindfulness. So um, mindfulness is by definition a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment 
while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. So there are lots of ways to, um, I suppose, learn to be mindful. The reason, uh, the reason mindfulness is important is that anxious teens and adults tend to have, uh, they tend to overthink, they tend to have overactive minds. And they're often doing two or three things at once or doing one thing and thinking of another. And that's actually quite stressful because it overloads, you know, a person mentally and emotionally. So um, um, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to go through some everyday mindfulness tips here. Um, yes, you can go and learn and do mindfulness classes or even get mindfulness apps. But these are strategies that, that you can implement that don't really require you sitting down and, and doing anything special that will help you just to become more mindful in your everyday life. And that will help you lower your anxiety levels. One is to just do one thing at a time. So um, if you're, um, how can I say? <coughs> If you're doing if you're doing this if you're if you're doing your schoolwork, be doing your schoolwork, not um, being on social media or doing other things at the same time. Um, if you're going for a walk, uh, enjoy going for a walk rather than thinking about some problems that are going on in your life. Um, it's probably best, the idea of doing one thing at a time is if you're having a talk to someone, it's about paying attention and being present rather than thinking of what you've got to say next or some other thing. It's, it's best summarized as an old Buddhist saying, when you're chopping wood, chop wood. So this is very difficult for anxious people because their minds are always going, 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 and they get, they get overloaded. So um, go for that walk. Uh, focus on that sunset, um, focus on, on your homework or talking to your friend, but don't, don't be doing two things at once. Don't be multitasking so much. Learn to have an internal version versus an external focus of attention. So a lot of, a lot of anxious teens and anxious adults for that matter are in their head, are worrying, thinking, anticipating, stressing, and not really, they're not really engaged with, you know, they're not smelling the roses. They're not really uh, um, connected with their environment. Um, so that's what I mean by internal versus external focus of attention. It's to, you need to develop a capacity to, um, to, to sort of shift your attention and focus from inside yourself to outside yourself. And this is one of the simplest and quickest ways for short-circuiting anxiety. You know, you're sitting in a chair um, worrying about this or that. Or you could be sitting in a chair and noticing the feeling of your feet on the floor, the hum of the air conditioner, the softness of the cushion against your body. And just by, so just by taking your attention, you, you focus from inside your head to outside your head and the physical connection with your surroundings, you'll immediately notice yourself starting to feel calmer. And that's without having to do any special meditation training or mindfulness exercises, just by shifting your attentional focus backwards and forwards, inside and outside. And we all have that capacity. Um, it's, with, with anxiety, it's a, bit, it's a little bit like your attention has got jammed. It's, it's jammed inside. It's jammed on the past. It's jammed on, you know, what, what bad things could happen. Um, you need to practice that attentional flexibility. And again, man, just maintaining uh, a bodily awareness. You know, what, it, what, what, is, what is the air smell like? What's the temperature? Um, what what uh, physical things are you in contact with at the moment? Um, can you smell some flowers? Just that, that whole bodily awareness things that takes you out of your head and that will help you feel relaxed and calmer pretty quickly. Um, another uh, important thing is to have what's called non-goal-oriented mental spaces. 
So anxious teens, or and again, adults for that matter, are often trying to keep themselves busy as a way of um, feeling, um, avoiding their feelings and feeling in control. Um, but really, this just becomes, uh, you know, a bit like a rat, you know, a mouse on a sort of wheel going around and around. Um, you, you need sometimes just to go for a walk and smell the roses without really um, necessarily trying to achieve anything. And it's in those empty mental spaces that um, one develops an awareness of oneself and the ability to be calm in the present and often, you know, to have inspiration and creative thinking happening. And a great way to do that is to spend time in nature, away from your computer screen. Yes. All right. Um, another really important one is to never, never, never judge your feelings. Um, in recent years, uh, neuroscientists have discovered that we have feelings because they tell us what supports our survival <laughs> and what detracts from our survival. So there are no bad feelings, whether it's anxiety, depression, fear, anger even. All feelings are signals about um, you know, our, our, our space in the world and our engagement with the environment. Um, it's just wrong to judge yourself or, or, you know, for what you're feeling. Uh, whatever you're feeling, it's there for a reason. It's trying to warn you of danger or alert you to some problem or help you to deal with things. Please take this as my top tip of probably for coping with anxiety is that and uh, every, every human being should, should have this tattooed or plastered somewhere around. Okay, another um, quite important uh, thing for managing anxiety is to develop a tolerance for uncertainty. Because un uncertainty is one of the biggest triggers of anxiety, whatever other things may cause it. Because when, any, when a human being is faced with uncertainty, um, you know, it triggers anxiety and apprehension. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> but uncertainty is... It's part of life, it's unavoidable. And yes, it is stressful, and it should be, but that doesn't mean it should be avoided because uncertainty is where you grow. And I'll give you a quick little example of this. Um, some of you may have heard of Martina Navratilova. She was a, a famous tennis player and uh, a very successful tennis player, but every now and then her the coach would uh, say, say, tell her that she had to change her service, the way she served. And um, she would get stressed by this because she'd been serving a certain way. And now, you know, he, you know, her coach wanted her to change the way she did something that she'd been doing a certain way for a long time. And in fact, her whole tennis game uh, would go off for a week or two until she had uh, mastered, you know, the new, the new way of serving. But she knew that she had to do that in order to, you know, to be successful and to be good at what she was doing. So she had to, you know, to tolerate that uncertainty and, and the fact that she was making the mistakes because the movements weren't so natural to her. But that's what made her a success. So uncertainty is, is necessary. Um, it's stressful, but it's where you grow. You can um, help, what will help cope with uncertainty is using the anxiety management skills that we've talked about and taking baby steps. So um, just dealing with change um, one step at a time rather than trying to do it all at once. Okay, so uncertainty, very important. All right, now we're coming to um, one of my favorite anxiety management uh, strategies, it's called bilateral stimulation, um, which simply refers to alternating audio, visual, or tactile uh, stimuli. So uh, in the uh, picture that you see there, the lady is 
hearing audio um, bilateral clicks that go backwards and forwards, left and right. And what that what, what that does is it um, basically um, remember we talked about anxiety and the survival response. So when your brain detects uh, a bilateral stimulation, it, it actually triggers a sort of survival response as your brain tries to figure out what that sound is and where it's coming from. <coughs> And um, it's called, it's, it's actually a thing called your origin response. And it's automatic. So once your brain, once your brain detects bilateral stimulation, it forgets about whatever problem or worries you're, you're currently having. Because at a, at a kind of primitive level, it's looking for a saber toothed tiger. And while your brain's in survival mode, it won't do anything else. So bilateral stimulation is kind of smart because what it's actually doing is it's activating your fight flight response and then piggybacking on it to turn off your anxiety. Because what happens after about 30 seconds of bilateral stimulation is that your brain realizes that, you know, whatever that is, it isn't a saber toothed tiger. And your brain goes into a relaxed mode. Um, which happens um, in your limbic system, which is the emotional part of your brain. And that happens automatically and it happens very quickly without any mindfulness or positive thinking or self-talk or anything like that. And um, it, it, so bilateral stimulation uh, comes out of EMDR, which is a stands for eye movements, desensitization and reprocessing. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but it's a... Uh, treatment for post-traumatic anxiety and increasingly um, other kinds of anxiety. And researchers have found that bilateral stimulation has all these wonderful effects on, on stress and tension and that it stimulates decreased tension, worry, uh, uh, relax, uh, increased relaxation. Um, it actually facilitates a kind of mindfulness effect. So it helps the person feel more, more present in the, in the moment. Um, it makes problems seem kind of further away and more distant. So, because when you're anxious and you're uptight, it feel, you know it feels like the problems up there in your face. But when you feel relaxed, you get you get more of a distant perspective, and problems seem f further away and more distant, and your perspective changes. And last but not least, um, bilateral stimulation has been found to stimulate delta brainwave activity which is associated with restful sleep so it can even help with sleep um, i've created um, one of the first apps um, that incorporates bilateral stimulation for anxiety called anxiety release and you can see it there it's available on um, itunes uh, through the app store and also for android um, and it has um, uh, a lot of other uh, information and things for helping with anxiety there. <coughs> okay, so last but not least, uh, let's look at how to turn anxiety into a, a superpower. So if you take away all the negatives of anxiety, you're left with heightened intuition, uh, including an ability to sense others' needs a heightened awareness of danger, increased preparedness, perfectionism, tenacity, and unwillingness to quit. Uh, anxious people tend to be people pleasers. They, they like to uh, meet the needs of others and make people happy. Uh, it just re it reduces their stress levels and helps them to feel better about themselves. And they're, they're better at risk management. So, um, um, you're probably familiar with the X-Men movies, and a lot of the uh, a lot of super superheroes that are that are in these movies are actually have characteristics that are founded in anxiety. Strangely enough, so for example, Professor X, the the head of the X-Men, can read can read people's minds. 
And in a way, that he, that's a kind of manifestation of the ability to sense what other people are feeling. That's a very real superpower. The trick is that you've got to do it um, in a way that's balanced with an awareness of your own needs. If you're too focused on the, on the needs of others um, at the expense of your own needs and self-awareness, um, then you lose sight of who you are and just become an object of everyone else's wants and desires and you lose authenticity. Um, it's probably a, a matter for another webinar to talk about um, how to balance that out. Although hopefully some of the things I've talked about tonight will do that. Okay, let's look at another superpower, heightened ability to sense danger. So um, you're probably familiar with the Spider-Man character. Now I grew up on the comics, and I'm not sure if they show this in the movie, but Spider-Man has a sort of sixth sense that enables him to tell if someone's sneaking up behind him with, with bad intentions. So um, uh, anxious people also have a heightened sense uh, of danger. And um, again, if, it's, if, that's, if that's not overdone, if that's, if that's balanced, um, it can actually help them in their survival and avoid accidents and injuries. And I, I, I think actually anxious people make the best occupational health and safety officers, okay? So there are many careers where this can be a, an advantage. Um, this is a character called Mystique who has the ability to appear as, as someone she's not. She can make herself look like other people to blend in. And anxious people are, are often very, very good at um, sensing um, you know, what other people are expecting and adapting themselves to the demands of the situation in order to blend in. And again, that's a great ability as long as it's not overdone and um, um, you know, done at the expense of developing their own individual sense of self. And there are many, there are so many more, but last but not least, we'll talk about Iron Man, who has um, uh, you know, this, the, the determination um, you know, to never quit until he's won the battle or completed the task. Um, his alter ego, Tony, Tony Stark, is also a very analytical, uh, creative sort of man who, you know, who can invent things. Um, so again, anxious people uh, never, they, they tend not to be quitters. They, in fact, they don't know when to quit and sometimes that's a problem. But they, they, once they've committed themselves to a task, they will see it through to the end. So there's a few, a few ways in which, um, if you know how to channel it, anxiety can be um, really uh, your, your superpower. And if you think that's just all a bit academic, we're just talking about movies and superheroes, well, no. Um, here's a list of successful people who have anxiety, who have, um, you know, really channeled their anxiety to make them more successful. Adele, Barbara Streisand, Bruce Willis. Did you know Bruce Willis has a stutter? Eric Clapton, the famous guitarist. Did you know that Eric Clapton was very, and still is very shy, and that he uh, actually taught himself to play the guitar as a teenager in order to pick up girls? Um, it's, it's a funny story, but he, his first guitar was a 16-string steel guitar, which was almost impossible to learn and to play on. But being the uh, determined, anxious kid that he was, he traded in for uh, a normal, easier pl to play guitar and kept, a kept away at it, and the rest is history. Um, as you probably can imagine, he doesn't have any trouble getting girlfriends anymore. And so it goes. So um, anxiety can be, a, a, you know, a, there's no doubt that if you know how to channel it, and how to control it and manage it can be a secret of success. All right, last but not least, so um, 
the tips for parents and for teenagers have all I've summarized them all and you can download them from the website uh, anxietyreleaseapp.com and they're under the uh, under the blog section